Hey, that's, hey, that's, yeah. That's too much. I would say you do not yeah. need that much gain. I'd, I'd well, bring it down. But if we bring it down, we're just back to where we were. Yeah. Because I can, if I yell. Yeah. What do you think? We want a metronome <laughs> running through this whole thing? Uh, we probably don't want to hear that. What? It's a music podcast, dude. Yeah, but it's, I'm not going to be able to pace my timing to it. That's what, 120 BPM. You might talk at 120. I'm going to probably talk at about 98. Oh. The second coffee is just setting in. I would say give me a little bit more juice because even when I was eating the mic, ha, you see what I mean? Ha, there we go. That's probably good. Hey folks, welcome to another one of these uh, Hitmakers, the show about music and people who make it that I happen to know. Uh, so what can I say about this? Uh, today my guest is my brother, Micah Brown. Micah is a recording engineer. Oh, hang on, I think this is uh, turning out weird. Here we go, case in point. I was recording in stereo and I didn't realize it. So I have a rudimentary understanding of uh, how to record. I'm using GarageBand right now to record this full disclosure. The music in the background was recorded by me. Uh, Half of what you hear are, well, actually the guitars are real. Everything else is a MIDI instrument. So I understand the stuff well enough to use it, but really my expertise, my forte is in the playing of music that kind of are... The playing of instruments, that kind of side of it, I wouldn't even say it's necessarily composition, but uh, performance. Um, But anyhow, Micah, my brother, um, from a very early age, has been into recording, and uh, he's always recording lots of different bands. He now lives in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, He went to school in St. John's, Newfoundland, Memorial University, pursuing an engineering degree, which if you know anyone who's taken it, I certainly wouldn't have. (laughs) Uh, It's really demanding and it like takes up all your time, but he always had time to play in multiple bands and record seemingly every band in town. And since moving to Montreal, he's kind of kept that up. Uh, He now works at a studios there, entirely self-taught from what I understand and uh, takes an interest in it, knows a lot more than I do, and uh, is certainly more in touch with uh, how things are done now than I am. So I hope you enjoy this. I certainly do. I think I come off like as old and out of touch, but that's okay. So you can find a full list of stuff he's worked on at micahbrown.ca. He's also got a live performance series called Lost Opus, which you can find on YouTube and Instagram. As always, you can uh, follow me at Learn Drums on Instagram, learndrums.ca for the show notes. All right, let's get into it. That looks good to me. Yeah, the first one I think is a little hotter than the other two. It's a beta. Yeah. Beta 58. Is that a little hotter? Well, it's hypercardioid. What does that mean? It means the polar pattern is a little bit tighter in the front. You get a little bit of response in the back, but it's good for stage. Um the beta actually has a bit of a mid-range boost from what I remember. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a lot of drummers like the beta 57 for its rejection because it's, once again, it's hypercardioid, so it's a little bit of a tighter polar pattern. Okay. Yeah. A lot of drummers like to use the beta 57, but it's sort of a weird sounding mic, and it's one of those, in the studio, a lot of people still prefer the SM57. To, to my knowledge, I've used one before, and I'm sort of... It's, it's fine either way. I mean, it's a real small EQ cut or boost. Hmm. I'm not making productions where I'm not going to EQ a snare drum or a guitar cab because most of the time, me or the guitarists don't really know the tone they want to a total T. Oh, yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we have an idea. But, I mean, especially when you're working with bands, when they're just starting out, they think they know the sound they want, but they don't like they're they're like eighty percent of the way there, uh-huh. and they don't really understand what what sounds good. Like they they know they get records that they like, but it's hard for them to actually translate it 
Oh, I've with never her, been able to make tools. my drum sound on a recording like a recording that I like. Yeah, it's it's super hard. Drum kits are like recording drums are is insanely hard. It's it's super difficult. I always think about this with like uh, really like skilled hip hop producers, and I'm not saying like oh you're cheaping out, but it's like if like the ability to record a drum kit really well. Like if I saw a hip hop producer who could also kill recording a drum kit, I'd be like that person's got it all. They figured it all out because recording guitars isn't really hard. Mm-hmm. But recording drums is like insanely difficult. You can sort of, or recording like a produced modern drum sound. Okay. And for the audience, Micah, why is that? Why is that? Oh, because you, if you're going to make a produced modern cohesive drum sound, you need a lot of microphones. So you need to understand the placement of them. You need to have drums that sound good in the first place. And typically how a drum sound is sort of composed is you have a lot of small elements, some microphones very close to objects in places that your ears would never be. And some that are supposed to, supposed to fill it out a little bit more, that are further away, that sort of get a roomier sound. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I've yeah. had, um, how much? Like, what are your thoughts on tuning versus muffling? Tuning versus muffling. I mean, they're two different things. I've sort of encountered <clears throat> this with. Oh, excuse me, just cop right into the mic. But I was recently making a set of drum samples, and I I sort of really came to this conclusion of uh, if you muffle a drum really bad, it's going to sound good right away, but it will not sound like a resonant drum. Right, exactly. So it's like a lot, And a lot of those 70s drum sounds, especially I guess 60s stuff too, but I still think of 60s stuff as being like a little bit more roomy and reverby. Yeah. Um, like coming out of Motown or whatever, where it's like recording a band in a room versus like you think of those 70s, like particularly Tom's, where it yeah. just is like super like, yeah, or the or the eighties, your gated reverb sounds and things like that. The gated reverb sound, could you theoretically do it with a muffled drum? Yeah, but you're not going to get that stick attack that's going to feed the reverb nicely. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to take a second to think about because that. even if you're so a muffled drum, you know it's going to die out a lot quicker. Mm-hmm. So if you have a gated drum sound, which you're going to kill quickly with a gate. But you have more sound to before you squash it. Yeah, and just like really high end, like the transient is going to have a lot more high end to it uh-huh. because of the because of the resonance of the head and the and way the stick bounces off of it. When you say transient, what does that mean? A transient. Well, the transient is the the uh, the spike in waveform that happens when you create a sharp, sudden sound. Yeah, so it's like I always look at it as it's like it's the biggest part of the sound or it's like the attack part of the sound it's the attack part of the sound attack is a really good word to use because people sort of get it immediately Mm. yeah they don't really consider an attack uh, a consistent push for a large amount of time it's like a strike yeah totally yeah so i mean recording drums i i didn't mean to like say that hip-hop producers don't have chops they have a lot of chops that rock producers just don't naturally have Mm -hmm. but recording a drum set is as far as like skill goes to do it well and to get good unique sounds uh, it's extremely difficult and to the point now that even the most pro of pro drum producers use samples everyone uses drum samples for close mics like everyone it's not like you might think that they don't but if they don't it's almost more of an aesthetic choice than if they do Hmm. it's become such a standard and most people make their own samples they sample their own kits in the studio and they can go and grab them and, you know, add, add consistency. But it really is a question of you can compress the signal, a close mic signal, and make that transient. So if you're hitting a drum and you're hitting it over and over again and you're in a chorus section, you want that snare drum to hit with a lot of consistency and it's coming down in the same way over and over again mm-hmm. because you want the chorus to drive. Now in a different section... Uh, you might you might let it flow a little bit more because it's a bit more feel, but a chorus you really want it to push forward and, and be very strong. So one way to do that is uh, with compression. So you control you know how big the peaks are, but there's another element of hit consistency. Even if you have a consistent volume, will it be tonally consistent? Will it sort of have a similar character? You can have a hit that's the same volume, but it can sound it can sound off. I'm sure you've listened to isolated drums before, 
Mm-hmm. And of course. And it's not going to sound really bad or anything, but the modern pop rock produced drum sound that we're used to now, it's uh it's it's consistent with this. It's it's you have a very consistent sound. So typically you have your own samples that you then blend in with the drum kit to add a certain amount of consistency, but you don't want to totally destroy it and just mm-hmm. have the have the triggered drum sound. Yeah, you're right. We don't expect to hear like a flub in a modern recording, although in uh, older music that couldn't have been avoided. Now, this is uh, kind of a more, I guess, opinion question. Uh, do you think that that is a positive development overall for music? Um, I think it's I think it's n- <clears throat> neutral. It's it's a it's a really tough one because I think it just creates multiple different mediums, and right. I'll sort of you know elaborate that on that a bit, but. I think there are many mediums in which music is delivered now. There's the live show, there's live recordings, and there is the record. And I don't think it's problematic that the record sounds perfect because you want to create a really tight product that people immediately latch onto because they only have a limited amount of context as mm-hmm. to what's actually happening. In a live setting or a live recording, where these fl- these flubs, you know, will tend to happen. People have a lot more context clues. They're seeing the band. They see how they dress. They see how they move. They see the energy of the delivery. Maybe they have visual cues like uh, backdrops or lighting shows or different things like that. So in the context of that, of a real person performing something in front of you, it's acceptable to be imperfect. Mm-hmm. In the context of a song on the radio... You know, there's not really that margin for error, and mm-hmm. everybody has the tools, so they operate outside of human constraint and let the computer <laughs> take over. Now, does every single recording require that? Not necessarily. But if you want to engage with that world, it's sort of just how it well, is. I, I don't I, think, it, I, I don't I, think I it's better or worse. That it's, that's where we're at. I guess the thing that I always wonder is, my own opinion or my own theory is that if we see something like we're our own worst critics and if we see something we can fix, we're going to do it. Mm -hmm. And this is as much as I complain about having my drums chopped up and quantized uh, when I've recorded them um, and having that done by other people. When I do it on my own, if I record to a click and there's a grid and I'm not on it, my tendency is to go in and drag stuff around and line it up to the grid because it looks wrong. Mm. Um, and I think in another time, uh, you just wouldn't have had that option, so it didn't get done. Now we do have the ability to do that, so we want to do it because um, I don't know if it's about chasing perfection. It certainly it is like it looks wrong, or it looks like you know we're so used to. Um, I think it's important to escape the looks wrong aspect of it and see if you, en- if you like how it sounds. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, <clears throat> I have recordings, modern recordings that I like a lot that are contain uh, looped recordings in them. Mm-hmm. And you'll hear things like finger scratches. And I mean, maybe they could become a little percussive at a, at a certain point, but those things can be removed. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, it's a perfectly timed loop. So you're not listening to somebody playing the guitar. Mm-hmm but you're listening to this new thing that somebody's doing, but it still contains imperfections. So I think there are, there's, there's sway both ways. I think what's more important is how does it sound to you? Mm-hmm. And, and you do exist within an ecosystem whether you want to admit it or not. And if you want to connect with people, you do have to acknowledge that ecosystem to some extent. Oh, totally, yeah. I, I, I think that's totally right. Um, but I also, I guess, think that those things are all kind of at odds with each other. Cause one thing I would say, um, how it sounds to you is going to be colored by a lot by like, does this make me sound bad? Is this embarrassing? Mm-hmm. So you, uh, it's like airbrushing your own pictures or something where 
you you want to look as perfect. I think that is just a person's natural tendency. Of course. Um so I mean that's human nature whatever and I think also w- within the commercial ecosystem uh there's not really room for um that kind of the risk that something is going to be you know not played because it's bad in this way. Um but I also I think the vulnerabilities can be marketable though. Oh yeah, I think so too. I I think that um I don't know. I'm just personally not really a fan of a lot of things that are quantized and there are people who uh work around it. So I I shouldn't say that. I probably am a fan of a lot of things that are quantized, but uh, drums in particular, I can tell that they are lined up metronomically. Um, I I feel like there's something that's lost. You like to hear a drummer play the drums. Yeah, and I think that it's it's like having it's like false beauty standards, or even if you look at like actors now mm-hmm. versus actors fifty years ago. Yeah, like everybody is in amazing shape now every actor is like jacked like a professional well they're all on steroids uh-huh and <laughs> you're not going to get the role if you don't look good with your shirt off like mm-hmm. um i think uh, one interesting element to to sort of this and um maybe this was created in with people like you in mind but is uh is the live session and how prevalent that has become True. and how that is a staple for selling your band at some point. Yeah. Because people do miss that and people do enjoy that. And that's sort of a testament as to uh, how do you exist as an artist now you play live. Mm-hmm. So I think people do desire that still. And well, it, yeah. I found it interesting what you said too about um, recording being made as kind of part of an ecosystem. Um where it's not necessarily even about how it's a piece of standalone art, but it's you have to look at it as part of the entire package, mm-hmm. if you like, of uh, what an artist is and how people engage with that. Absolutely. Well, just a just a an example of this that I sort of loved, and I'm just getting into this band, so I, I've been fanboying a bit, but. Uh, from the 1975, their new record, the song I was just playing for you, the one that I call the Joy Division Garage Band song. Yeah. Um, the track is almost completely electronic, and even the guitar sounds DI'd through an amp sim. Yeah, totally. When they play it live, they play it in a rock band configuration. Uh huh. And I'm sure there is some sampling, but the the one video I found of somebody filming them live, it was a rock song. Do you think the drummer's playing to a click? Uh, most definitely. Do you think they're using tracks? Uh, it's, it was too hard to tell on the cell phone, Uh but it sounded like real instruments. It didn't sound like the, it didn't sound like the record. Oh yeah. Yeah. But the big draw too, I think is their vocalist is, uh, enigmatic or, um, is that the right word? I'm not sure. Anyways, the vocal list is very animated, has great delivery, plays off of the crowd and all these things. And that's actually what people care about. Yeah, totally. In a bigger way. I don't think anybody there was just like, oh, didn't sound electronic enough. Like, Oh, yeah, yeah, and I don't know that, I mean, electronic music is huge, mm-hmm. and I mean, I really love some of it. Um, rock music is <laughs> arguably I think it's still, a thing of the past. Well, but I think it's still more compelling in a live scenario, uh, electronic artists often rely off of visuals and, and uh, you know, projection shows and things like this. And I think the ability to perform as a live band is as impressive as always. Oh, yeah, I agree. Because, um, yeah, I think, like, people... Uh, I think that technology... Uh, my personal feeling is that technology has evolved much faster than our capacity to make sense of it has. So I think the things that used to be exciting are still exciting. And I think the thing behind, especially chopping up and perfecting recordings, is not that we we require it as humans or as listeners. My feeling is like music is made by humans for humans to listen to. 
Um, and again, I, I would relate it to like beauty standards where, you know, people in magazines are airbrushed and photoshopped and blah, 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 because the way they actually look is somehow unacceptable. It's not unacceptable, but it doesn't look right in the magazine because we're so used to seeing that context. Yeah. And I think it's like, if you want it to sound modern, if you want it to sound like something new, um, that's when that stuff comes into play and you want to sound not like something from the past. Um, but I, I do think that uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And cliches are cliches for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but you know what I mean. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, where you go to a show and seeing somebody who can deliver the goods live is uh, still exciting. I think a, a large, well, what's what's to blame for the trends oftentimes is the technology, but also the, the consumption mediums. Mm-hmm. And we're seeing developments in those consumption mediums that is allowing for a change of taste. And hopefully we continue to refine them um, to serve the listener. And the artists will find ways to exploit these to uh, excite the listener. So uh, a couple instances of this are how people now need to master for different digital mediums because people are... You know, we've, we, we've all heard about the loudness war, about how people kept pushing how much loudness per se so the the you know LUS value or the root mean square value the average volume of a song is at a certain level relative to the to the mm-hmm. peak so there's basically like a digital zero and if you go above that you're clipping an audio signal so then people try to push you know how frequently they're approaching that peak to create a loudness so it's like the fat sausage waveform that you sort of see mm-hmm. um so Do now Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say that different people will... So now you have services like Spotify who have their own means for analyzing you know, how loud something is, per se, this, this average amount of energy in the waveform over a certain amount of time. Mm-hmm. And um, people are becoming aware of what these things are. You know, They're being told by the services or they're finding it themselves. And then they'll find ways to exploit it so that their content sounds the best possible for that medium. I mean, it should just sort of be standard, mm-hmm. but it almost seems a little bit coy because the algorithms are always changing. So a good example of this um, is, you know, we were talking about uh, things, things were one way and things are another way now. And how do we get there? And why, why is it this? It's not that anybody got exponentially better it's that the medium changes so you know if you put a vinyl record straight on spotify it's not really going to stand up it's gonna be too quiet it's gonna be too quiet and it's gonna sound probably weird yeah and this is i mean this is just another part of the collective battle but it has to do with the delivery methods and the technologies within them oh i think it's like the medium is the message is totally true yeah where if you are listening to I don't know, if you listen to a cassette, you expect a certain thing and there's a certain aesthetic. If you're listening to music on your phone, you consume it differently and different things are going to hit you. Yes, yeah. Yeah, there was a, it's sort of an example of this. I don't want to go go on too much of a tangent, but just about how the medium is the message and how that is changing so rapidly. Um, and uh, so there's this, uh, a, a local band from PEI and um, they released uh, a single, and uh, a local producer, great pop producer, and when you turn it on, it's so loud, and it's mm-hmm. so incredibly in your face, it immediately sounds, quotation marks, better than anything else that you're listening to, mm-hmm. because I think the medium was completely exploited to the point that it's like, this is as far as it can be pushed. Mm-hmm. To which, at some point... It might be like, you know, you're, you're just going to lose dynamic range. But then I turned on Kings of Leon, Sex on Fire, which is a huge song 10 years ago. Something like that. Digital. It was probably recorded digitally. 
Oh, definitely. You turn it on and it sounds like just completely underwhelming. And really? that's an anthemic song. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because because modern producers are completely exploiting the mediums for somebody somebody's song comes on a playlist, it comes through and the kick drum hits you so hard that you're immediately like, What's this? It sounds yeah. crazy and it sounds huge. And it's not just hitting it as hard as you can, or at least from my knowledge it isn't. It's knowing how hard you can hit it for that medium and then it will through the algorithm go through really, uh, really strong and powerfully. I don't know, you know, that could have been the band's choice, that could have been the producer's choice, but that is not uncommon for people to sort of make these very forward mixes for, for playlist purposes. Right. Um, are you somebody who listens to playlists recreationally? I have my own, uh, like my Spotify daily or weekly that they curate for me. uh uh-huh. I'll check into that uh-huh. because it's, you know, what I would probably enjoy in my ecosystem of music. And uh, I do check in. I'm not, um, I don't, I don't like listen to the outliers or hit makers, or whatever playlist. I don't really. Everyone should listen to hit makers. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, you know, I have some friends getting on these playlists and it seems to get them some plays, but I don't know if there's legitimate retention there. Well, it seems like that's the game, right? Everybody's trying to be on a playlist now. Um, and that's like, you know, it's not about getting your video on much music or whatever, and getting even like being on SNL necessarily, which at this point is more of a... I feel like it's more of a milestone for the artist than it is an attention thing or, you know, like being on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine or whatever you want to call it. Because I also, my feeling in watching kind of the ascendance of a lot of the current pop stars, I'm thinking of people like uh, Drake and Ed Sheeran, uh, where there's not really a point in their career where like something that you can point to that really changed the game in the way that Smells Like Teen Spirit would have. Right. Uh, it's more like they build and build and build and build, and maybe you're paying attention to them and you're a fan, or maybe you just are kind of aware of that they exist. Then mm. all of a sudden they're huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and when you achieve a certain stature, re- anything that you do is news. Yeah, totally. Um, but so the playlist seems to be... That's the one thing that, as an unknown artist, really seems like it can propel you, um, get people to listen to your music. But <laughs> experientially, it's like it's not what I like to do, and it's maybe because I'm old. But I also am like a little bit curmudgeonly. I don't like somebody else programming music for me, mm-hmm. and I don't mm-hmm. like not knowing what I'm listening to. So. I would rather pick something out and deliberately put it on and listen to it because that's what I've chosen. Um, And I don't want to be running to my phone every three minutes to see what the band is. And that's if I like it. And if I don't like it, I don't want to listen to it in the first place. Right. So for me, it's inefficient. But I recognize that I am not the typical music listener. I think part of the playlist model is uh, retail stores and Shazam. Ah... So these playlists, you know, you have a, a, a restaurant or anything else like this, and they play a Spotify playlist because it fits the quote-unquote vibe. The vibe, yeah. Oh, what- I've definitely, when I worked in a coffee shop, you know, like acoustic morning vibes or whatever. Absolutely. Or like how many chill cafe playlists are there? Absolutely. And so now and I just started using Shazam again. Like in its infancy, I checked it out. thought it was a cool app. But I've just tried it out again. Because I've had a couple instances of being in these locations, being like, "What is this song? Like, who are these artists?" Yeah. Because I don't know the B-list pop artists. I, you know, I yeah, I, I don't I, care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll find them, and I'll be like, "Oh, this person is like huge." But uh, something that can be seen is how many times it's been shazammed. Uh huh. So not only do you have, oh, this song has been listened to X amount of times, it's been shazammed three million times. Yeah. I met a guy who worked for a major label 
And he told me that they sign people based on the Shazam charts. Well, yeah, and Shazam is an interesting one, too, because it's it's direct engagement. You have to open up the app. You have to engage the algorithm. Yeah, which you is, have to want to know yeah. what you're hearing badly enough to go through the work. Yeah. yeah, so it's sort of a weird indicator and a, a good little bit of uh, user-generated content. All right, there you go, folks. Did you learn something? I certainly did. Uh, once again, thanks to my bro, Micah Brown, for being here. You can check out micahbrown.ca for his online CV. Look up Lost Opus for uh, live, uh, what do you call it? Like live performance videos that he shot and recorded and edited together. Um, if you check out Watch Mojo on YouTube, you might see some of his handiwork. Or if you play uh, guitar and use pedals made by Montreal Assembly, you may be using something that he worked on. Uh, all right. Well, that's it for me. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I realize this one's a little bit shorter than uh, a lot of what I put out, which I think is not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, one piece of feedback I have gotten from people is that an hour a week is uh, it's a commitment. Um, but I also did have something else lined up that I was going to add to this that uh, the the audio didn't turn out. But if you keep your eyes peeled to my Instagram, I'm going to drop a piece of it later this week. So that's uh, at Learn Drums on Instagram, LearnDrums.ca for show notes. Micah's at MicahBrown.ca and Lost Opus. All right. Till next time. Bye bye.